uh, now. So if you could just grab our accept pad or whatever pops up on your screen. And so hello today to Ronan Carney. He's the Learning and Development Lead at Canada Life European Technology. And he's a recent graduate of the DCU Masters in Psychology and Wellbeing. And I'm sure you're going to hear a little bit about that. Ronan is a reformed technologist who now works in the L&D space and has a passion for psychology and understanding what makes people enjoy life and enjoy work. So he's going to chat with us today about how flow kind of comes into the workplace and how companies can support workplace well-being by encouraging employees to find their flow. And I suppose in light of the World Mental Health Day on Monday, this couldn't be more timely. So over to you, Ronan. Thank you, Neve. I am just trying to set up these slides here. So slideshow from the beginning. Um, hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. I've met Neve before. Obviously, I've met Billy before. Um, I think I've met Adrian before. Adrian, are you Adrian Tierney of Irish Life fame? I am, Ron. Yeah, are you? Brilliant, brilliant. Great to see and you. I'm Great to see you in the background. So uh, good to see you. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for having me here, folks, and and Neve for arranging this. Um, a brief intro, just beyond what what Neve has said, um, of my background. So, and that, like, how did I arrive here to be talking to you about flow? So, um, as Neve mentioned, I I I'm a reform technologist. So I worked in IT for a long time, and I went to Trinity and did a degree in IT years ago. But I'm not a natural techie, and I realised this pretty pretty soon into my IT career. Um, but I always had an interest in psychology. And eight years ago, I went off and did a, a psychology degree in DCU through the USCO program, which is open education and um, spare time education. So it took me four or five years to get the degree. And I did a thesis at the end of it, looking at personal development planning and staff engagement and particularly how people can become more engaged and basically happier at work if they have access to, to development opportunities, learning and development oppor opportunities. Um, and around the same time, I started to do a bit of public speaking. A friend of mine who was who was too cheap to pay for a, a non-religious wedding celebrant asked me to do it, which I did um, after being employed with a few pints of Guinness. Um, and it went well. I joined a local Toastmasters club to get a bit of practice speaking. And I did this, this, um, this wedding ceremony. A few more people then asked me to do a few more. And eventually I set up a website and started charging people because um, I was fed up doing them for friends and family for free. So I was doing that for a few years as a side gig. Um, as a, a non-religious wedding celebrant, which was great crack. It was really just chatting to people's friends and family, getting stories, and then weaving that into a like a 10-minute, 15-minute monologue on the day before getting into the serious stuff. Um, but I had to stop because I've no time to do anything else really these days with kids and ballet dancing and Irish dancing and football and all the rest. Um, but as Adrian will know, I set up a, a Toastmasters club in, in Irish life a few years ago, which Adrian was a member of and still is, I think. Um, so I kind of got I kind of got a name within the technology community as someone who's into learning and development, and um, which led me into my current role as the LD lead for like a large group of techies in across Canada Life Group. Um, but yeah, I really found the psychology side useful in figuring out how to motivate people and engage them and make work more fulfilling for people, I suppose. So I went back to DCU. Uh, to do a master's in psychology and well-being as Neve mentioned a couple of years ago and I finished in the summer um, and ironically it didn't do a whole lot for my well-being because like I really scrambled across the line just with with everything that's going on in my life at the moment but I, I managed to get there in the end and it was great um, but my final thesis was on flow in the workplace flow as like advanced engagement and I'll go into a bit more detail um, and particularly around how people managers and supervisors uh, can play a huge role um, in in creating the conditions for for flow in their teams, um, and that ultimately led me to to be here today speaking speaking to y'all about flow in the workplace, which is great. So, what is flow? So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with with the father of of flow, um, this guy here, Chick Sent Me High, and I spent the first the first month of my master's probably trying to figure out how to pronounce his name. So I've made it easy on you guys. If you haven't heard of him, some of you probably have, and I've spelled it out phonetically there, which would have helped me two years ago. Cheek sent me high. And he, he was one of the founding um, fathers of positive psychology himself and Martin Seligman, really. And Cheek sent me high really was the first one to come up with this term of 
flow, describing like advanced engagement, people being in the zone. Um, so this quote here kind of captures it nicely. So contrary to what we usually believe, the best moments in our lives are not the passive receptive relaxing times. The best moments usually occur if a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So a couple of years ago, if you ask me what, you know, happiness is, it's like sitting by the pool, Tenerife with a beer, the kids are in the kids club, whatever. But she sent me, I figured out that to be really happy and to be really engaged in life, to have a really fulfilled life, you need to be pursuing things that you're really interested in, that are challenging you um, and where there's a clear goal. That's, that's where real fulfillment happens on an ongoing, on an ongoing basis. So, but who was Csikszentmihalyi? So he was a Hungarian psychologist ultimately, but he spent time in a prisoner of war camp in, in World War II. And I think that experience, seeing how some people who had their whole lives taken away from them remained happy or at some level of happiness while other people were, were just devastated. And it kind of drove him to go off and um, study, you know, the causes of happiness. And he was inspired a lot by, by research by Carl Jung and people like that. Um, and he came to the conclusion that happiness, it isn't a rigid fixed state. It's something we have some control over, not complete control over, but some level of control. And it was interesting, he went off interviewing like athletes and musicians and artists and people in lots of different fields. And he identified that they were, they were happiest, but not just happy, but they were most productive and most creative when they were in this state that he called flow. And when they were in that state, work just flowed out of them. There was no effort. It, it just it just happened. They were just in the zone. They were just loving what they were doing. The rest of the world just kind of disappeared. Um, and and the effort just flowed out of them with, with no problem at all. So when you hear people describe being in the zone, usually you might hear, you know, sports people say that are musicians when they're performing, they're in the zone and they kind of lose sense of time and, and the rest of the world. That usually means an experience of flow. So I could probably start every slide with a quote from Csikszentmihalyi. This is the last one, I promise, Gabe, but it's a good one. So the happiest people spend much time in a state of flow, a state in which they're so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that they will continue to do it, even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. So the characteristics of that state then, I have this guy over here playing his guitar and we can really kind of link pretty much everything here to, to the idea of a musician uh, playing his trade there. So characteristics of flow, the activity is intrinsically rewarding. So this guy here, he's playing the guitar not to get paid or not to necessarily understand others, but because he likes playing the guitar, he enjoys doing that. And um, there are clear goals that while challenging are still attainable. So he might decide, okay, I'm going to learn a new song. I've been playing Stairway to Heaven for two years now, I'm going to figure out something new, a challenge, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone and I have the skill level here through practice to achieve that. There's a complete focus on the activity itself. So you can see there, he's got his eyes closed, he's in the zone, he's just living in the moment, he's playing the guitar um, and nothing else matters. Feelings of personal control of the situation and the outcome. So he's got control, he can play the guitar, he has a guitar and he's able to play it, he's able, able to concentrate on doing that. Feelings of serenity, loss of self-consciousness. So you can see he looks fairly serene there and he's immersed in what he's doing. So he's not thinking about himself. He's not, he's, he's lost his, his self-consciousness. And there's immediate feedback. So the idea of playing guitar, the feedback is what he can hear, what he's playing. He can hear as he strums, each string, the notes, the chords that are coming back. So if he's getting that immediate feedback. Looking at the example of an athlete, a runner gets that feedback. You know, they feel their muscles warming up, they can feel themselves progressing uh, along the track or wherever it is they're running or, you know, oxygen coming into their lungs. So it's that immediate feedback that, you know, what I'm doing is having an impact. There's a balance between skill and the challenge presented. So this is a real key part of flow. There has to be a balance between skill and challenge. If this guitarist is playing a tune that, you know, he learned 10 years ago that he finds easy, he could do in his sleep, it's not challenging him. He's not going to get into the zone. Likewise, if he tries to play a tune that's much too challenging for him, that he doesn't have the skills for, he's just going to get he's going to get stressed and give up. Um, lack of awareness around physical needs. So when he gets into the zone there, playing guitar, he's challenged using all his skills. He forgets about his physical needs. You know, he might stop playing in an hour and go, oh, God, I'm starving or I'm thirsty or my fingers hurt. But typically, when you're in the flow zone. There's a lack of awareness around physical needs. 
strong concentration and focused attention and then losing track of time passing. So you'll often hear people say that they're involved in some sort of activity and it might be a conversation with a friend or it might be playing a musical instrument, it might be playing sport, could be anything, but they lose track of time. They say, where did that hour go? So that's typically someone describing that they were in flow. So the benefits of flow, like we could do, we could do an hour or two simply on the benefits of flow and there's a lot of research out there, but ultimately flow makes people happy. And the experience of flow in everyday life, it's an important component of creativity and well-being. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, because it's intrinsically rewarding, uh, the more you practice it, the more you seek to replicate. So you want to do more of that, um, which help lead to a fully engaged and happy life. So again, going back to the guitarist, he likes playing the guitar. He likes challenging himself, learning new tunes. Time flies by. So he's probably going to spend as much time as he can doing that, or at least a certain amount of time every day. Similar to an athlete, if somebody likes running, they get away, they get in the zone, the rest of the world kind of melts away. They're probably going to look to do that as much as they can. And all that's really life enhancing. Um, and yeah, flow experience in sport have been associated as research here to show that it's linked to long-term participation in sport and exercise, so good for your physical health. And again, in the, the sphere of music, uh, flow state has been linked to enhanced teaching and learning outcomes and enjoyable performance experience. Um, and interestingly, it's been positively associated with physical health in elderly people. And that probably comes down to the, the idea of having purpose and meaning. So if people can find something in their lives, be it, again, playing music or conversation with a friend or playing cards, whatever it is, where you can get into that zone and lose yourself, um, that, has, that provides meaning and purpose in people's lives. And that's been positively associated with, with physical health. So how, how do we achieve flow? I've, I've boiled it down into these, these four elements here. So the first one is setting clear goals. So again, relating back to our, our musician, there has to be a clear goal. If he's just sitting down to strum away on the guitar, he's unlikely to get into flow. But if his, if his goal is to complete a song or complete a piece of music or a new piece of music, he has that kind of end in sight and that challenge is there in front of him. So he has something that he's trying to work towards. Eliminating distractions. So more about this in a second. And distractions are, are a big part of people struggling to get flow. And there's so many distractions in, in modern life. Um, but if he's trying to play the guitar and there's kids coming in and um, asking, can you put on the TV or the doorbell is ringing or, you know, if there are other people around, very difficult to get into that flow zone. Adding an element of challenge. So this comes back to the skills versus challenge and finding that ideal balance. So again, if he's playing the same tune over and over again every day, likely to get bored um, and definitely won't get the flow zone where if he's constantly pushing himself on a bit, okay, this week I'm going to try and nail this song. And once I get that, well then that's my new comfort zone. My skills have stretched out. So I'm going to now push myself beyond that again and try to take on a new challenge, maybe a more technical piece of music. Um, and one of the key things then is choosing a pursuit you enjoy. So very difficult to achieve flow um, in an activity that, that you don't enjoy. So it's, it's about finding things that you do enjoy. And everybody has at least one thing or a couple of things in their lives that they do enjoy. Um, so it's about finding that one thing and really committing to that and seeing can you get into flow um, through that pursuit. But flow, of course, applies in work as well. And Csikszentmihalyi himself identified this. And there are many parallels with what people do in, in um, outside of work to what we do inside of work. Um, so flow can occur when workers are engaged in tasks where they're able to focus entirely on the project at hand. Um, so getting back to distractions there. And um, for example, a coder might experience this while trying to solve a program programming problem or an interior designer might achieve flow while brainstorming ideas for a new project. Um, and Csikszentmihalyi I determined the flow, it's not only essential to a productive employee, but crucial for a contented one as well. So this is of interest at an organizational sense, because if you have, if you have engaged employees and employees that might even be achieving flow, they're going to be very creative and they're going to be very committed and very productive. Um, but at, a, at an individual level as well, that employee is going to be going to be a happier employee and is more likely to bring others along with them and is, and is more likely to stay with the organization. 
So what does flow look and feel like at work? So same as in other spheres, playing music, playing sport, whatever it is. Somebody who's in flow at work is going to be totally immersed or absorbed in a task. They're going to have highly energized focus. Um, so you might get people who are really, really busy being very immer or immersed or absorbed in a task, but they mightn't have highly energized focus. They might be displaying uh, stress or they might be under pressure and it's not sustainable. But someone in, in the flow zone typically is going to be very focused and relaxed um, while they're completing that task. Transformation in one sense of time. So like I mentioned earlier, time would just fly by. Where did the morning go? Or I can't believe it's 11 o'clock already, that kind of thing. And enjoyment in the work without necessarily being aware of this due to the focus uh, involved. So when we're in the flow zone, we tend not to be aware of it. So we, we typically wouldn't say, oh, I'm in, in flow here. This is great. I'm having a great time. It tends to happen afterwards when you've transitioned back to your, your normal state out of flow and you might reflect, may or may not reflect, but you might reflect and say, oh God, I was in the flow zone there. Time just flew by. I was really enjoying that. I was really productive. I came up with some good ideas. I really enjoyed that. I'd like to do it again. Um, but because all of our cognitive resources are, or so much of our cognitive resources are invested while we're in flow on the task we're doing, which is the nature of it, tend not to have the spare cognitive resources available to be aware of it at the time and um, which is really interesting and uh, so so it's it's helpful to know a bit about engagement and flow so that helps you then to reflect maybe at the end of the day or the end of the week and say did i actually achieve flow today or was i really engaged at any point today and um, because you might not necessarily be aware of it at the time for me an indicator of flow and i was chatting to me about this the other day um, I drink a lot of tea and I love tea. Like I, I drink lots and lots of tea. I won't tell you how much, but a lot. And I like going back a couple of years, I never got into flow and work. You know, I always enjoyed work and it was, it was fine. But in the, as my role evolved, and I, I started to kind of get involved in things that I had more of a natural interest in. I noticed that occasionally I'd turn around and there'd be half a cup of tea cold on the desk and it was starting to worry me at first. I thought, like, is, is my memory starting to get a bit dodgy? Uh, but it started to happen quite regularly. And I reflected on it and I noticed that it always happens when I was involved in a certain type of activity. And for me, like, I really enjoy, like, what I'm doing here now. Like, this is great. But when I get into flow is when I'm putting together a material like this. So I'm, I'm pulling in information from different areas or reflecting on things and collating information into a story that I subsequently might have to present or give a talk. But I get into flow when I'm bringing it all together. Maybe like, you know, an author does when they're, they're writing a book or maybe a musician when they're writing a song, that, that similar kind of thing where you're bringing information together. And I'll, I'll often leave half a cup of tea beside me. And the difference between being too busy or too stressed, if I was, if I was too busy in work or too stressed, I'd be going straight back to the cup of tea. I'd want to get another cup of tea. I'd be well aware of it because it's my crutch and it's getting me through the stress and it's helping me. And I'd probably have three or four in the time that I'd have half a cup of tea and then forget about it when I'm in flow. And um, so that was that was an interesting realization from my own point of view, um, because that, that was something that never happened to me. And then it had started to happen in the last couple of years when I started to get involved in work that was for me that was more engaging and, and personally fulfilling and um, so I might ask the group a bit later on if you if you have any indicators of flow yourself that you might you might have noticed or even just thinking now that might have might have popped into your head so flow at work again going back to this idea of skills versus challenges so on this this graph here or this this diagram uh, on the bottom left, we've got like abilities on the bottom, on, on the x-axis, I suppose. Abilities are skills. So if someone has low skills and they've low challenges, so they're in a job where they don't really have, they're not skilled really in any particular areas and they're not challenged, they're likely to be apathetic and depressed and lack in purpose. If the challenges in that job then start to increase, but their skills don't, they'll quite quickly start to become stressed um, and, and feeling a, you know, a lack of control as, as, they're, as the, the tasks start to get out of hand. As the challenges uh, continue to grow further, um, they'll, they'll quite quickly become very anxious and, and won't be able to, to 
complete the job. And that's kind of where burnout, burnout can happen. Um, but if we move along the x-axis and as skills grow, there's a chance that we can become more focused then as we're able to meet the challenges that are coming to us in work and the ideal place to get to. And this is this is idealistic. Nobody's in flow all of the time. But the top right of the graph here um, is where our skills are high and the challenges are high as well. So the challenges that we're dealing with, the tasks we're dealing with in work are making use of our skill set and even pushing us a little bit beyond the limits of our skill set. So we're really focused and we're really paying full attention uh, to what we're trying to achieve. And then if we achieve that, we've then pushed our skills limit out a little bit and now we're comfortable with, with a, a broader range of challenges. So that's that's the, the sweet spots there, that flow zone. And the, the key really is that we need to be looking at our skills and developing ourselves uh, but with that, then we need to be opening up ourselves to new challenges if we want to maintain flow. If we don't develop ourselves, if we don't develop our skills, and if we stick with the same challenges, we might get into a you know a confident or a a, a, a contented state. Um, but we're not going to get into that flow state, which is where we really get the the positive benefits in terms of our own well being. And. We all live in the real world, unfortunately, and we can't we can't get into flow um, all of the time, or at least most of us can't, um, because there are what we call flow teas, things that prevent flow at work. So there's a stat here from, from Daniel Goleman. Um, only 20% of workers enter flow at least once per day, while 15% never enter a state of flow on a typical day. So it's 15% of people never reach flow. Um, or 20%, 20% get there once a day, which is good. But like I said earlier, a lot of the time people might not be aware that they're in flow. So that limits the opportunities to, to seek more of it and to, to try and bring more of that into your role. Um, but the main flow thieves are a lack of goal clarity. So such an important thing. Um, it's challenging in, in, in my own workplace, people having clear objectives um, and not just for you know, 12 months from now, but even for next week, next month, long-term, medium and short-term objectives are so important for people to have that sense of purpose and meaning. What am I trying to achieve here? Um, limited feedback. So the guitarist can hear the tune coming back. You can hear uh, the strings being played. Again, the runner is out there running. They can feel the progress, how far they're getting. People in work sitting at a desk, it's so important for them to get that feedback and prompt feedback and effective feedback so they know that they're achieving um, what they're trying to do or they're, they're on that right path. If there's no feedback, very hard to feel connected to what you do and the difference they're making. Distractions are huge, particularly in the, the shift to hybrid working. So in the, the, the traditional office space, I suppose distractions would have been people coming up to your desk or the phone ringing or uh, a colleague being too loud and you're not being able to concentrate. In the hybrid world, it's interesting because a lot of those things don't exist anymore, but there are distractions that come via technology. Um, so the idea of distractions is, is kind of evolving there a little bit. Um, multitasking, the graph on the top right shows how in bright blue, if you're working on one project, uh, the light blue, you can dedicate all your time to that. But as you switch to two projects, we move along three, four, you can see the dark blue, how much time you spent switching, switching context. So that, that's basically your cognitive resources that are used up reframing to the, the other project or kind of catching up where was I that is ultimately lost. And the more you take on, the more multitasking you do, the less the, or the fewer chances you have to achieve flow. Um, and stress is a big one as well. So the, the graph in the bottom right kind of illustrates there's the, there's good stress known as you stress and then there's there's um, negative stress or distress, I suppose. So good stress or positive stress we all need that. We need that to, you know, get out of bed in the morning, to have motivation, to achieve things, to complete things um, in work and the rest of our lives. But as that stress continues, you can see performance starts to increase as well. But we'll get to this optimal zone, which is the green zone in the middle. And this is where flow happens. This is where the stress is manageable and it's pushed us to a level of performance that we can deal with that's sustainable. But if stress moves beyond that level, we move into the red zone where it becomes too much and we become distressed um, and 
anxiety and, and impaired performance. So flow happens in that, that key green zone in the middle. Um, and if there's too much stress, um, flow isn't going to happen. Very briefly, the, the study I did as part of the masters um, was around supervisor support and workers' flow experiences and looking a little bit around how work interruptions moderate that relationship. So, but ultimately just, I was really interested in, in the role leaders or supervisors and uh, managers play in, in um, providing the conditions and maintaining the conditions for flow um, in, in teams and in workplaces. So it was a cross-sectional study of, of 124 desk-based workers, primarily in tech and finance. A um, couple of different measures there for flow, supervisor support and work interruptions. Um, and the data analysis was um, yeah, correlations and regression and all that, that fun stuff that you, you can't avoid doing psychology study. Um, and to boil down the results, ultimately, um, employees who reported high supervisor support tended to report higher overall levels of workplace flow. Um, so although it was cross-sectional, so I couldn't, couldn't prove causation. So people who do achieve flow, perhaps they elicited supportive responses from their supervisors or perhaps supervisors through their support uh, provided the conditions for workplace flow. Um, but ultimately, the point is that leaders have the power to shape work environments and thereby create or maintain the conditions that are, that are crucial for flow. Um, a little bit more of that in a second. And the moderating role of work interruptions. So I didn't find a moderating role of work interruptions on, on that relationship between supervised support and flow. Um, and I had a theory there, like I mentioned earlier, that perhaps that was down to the evolution in, in how people perceive distractions, their uh, workplace distractions. So I'm working from home now. You know, I might tell someone I don't get distracted at all because there's nobody um, coming up to my desk or there's nobody speaking, you know, over by the water cooler and distracting me. However, distractions have evolved with all the different technology that's now available. Things like Microsoft Teams or Zoom as are on now or Slack, what, uh, WhatsApp, everything like that. So perhaps people perceive interruptions through those channels as part of work. Um, and not as interruptions. So um, I just highlighted that as, as an area where, where further research might, might be interesting. But the key finding was that supervisor support is linked to, to flow experiences. So, so supervisors have a key role to play. Uh, so what does that mean? Yeah, in the real world, so leaders, supervisors, managers, they hold a lot of power. Um, and with that power comes great responsibility. I think that might have been a, a quote from Karate Kid. I can't quite remember. Um, but how can we support flow in the workplace? So revisiting that slide I did on how do we achieve flow, I think I, there was four points on that. All of those apply in the workplace. And there's a couple more I've added here as well. So setting clear goals. So if you're a manager of people, like ensuring that your team have clear goals, short, medium, and long-term. But if you're a member of a team, ensuring that you have clear goals for yourself, you're not going to get into that flow zone, into that ideal state for your own well-being if you don't have goal clarity. Eliminating distractions. This might be, you know, no meeting Tuesdays or Friday afternoons. Nobody can come and talk to me. I can, you know, get to wrap up my week or Monday morning, whatever it is. Um, and again, if you manage people in a team, it's important to, to allow them uh, or empower them to be able to hide or get away from distractions if they need to do that, if they want to do that. And likewise for yourself, um, add an element of challenge. So again, going back to that skill, the challenge balance, like are you challenged in your work? Are your team challenged? Are people doing the same task they've been doing for a long time? Are people looking to do different things, but maybe they don't have the opportunity? So the more, the more we can challenge ourselves, um, and allow our skills to develop in line with that, the more, the more chance we have to be engaged and, and hopefully hit that flow zone. Um, choosing a pursuit you enjoy, like this, this is a big one for me, and I've put in brackets there, job crafting. Um, and I've done a lot of job crafting myself over the last couple of years, unwittingly at first, but I realized um, after, after the fact that I've done a lot of this, and job crafting is really trying to bring things into your job that you like doing, that kind of align with your natural strengths. So if you don't know what your natural strengths are, it's worth, worth going off and doing an analysis of it. And there are tools online um, for doing that, like the VIA strength analysis and things like this. Um, 
but bringing things into your your job that you're good at and that doesn't mean not doing all the things that you have to do anyway but maybe doing slightly less of them or chatting to your manager or or members of your team about maybe doing less of the things that that cause them stress that they don't enjoy doing and bringing in a few things where they they have a natural strength and a natural ability um and they're 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 much more likely to be engaged in. Um, and I've done, done a lot of this myself over the last couple of years by moving beyond technology into, into L&D and, and facilitating and um, knowledge sharing sessions and, and, and different areas like that. Um, so job crafting is a big one um, and something to consider. Opportunities to learn, mentor and teach. Um, so yeah. Opportunities for learning and development, of course, but a lot of people also like to mentor and teach others, and that can be really fulfilling and a really way to engage people who are who are interested in doing that. And that sense of bringing others along with you and building a network that way. And the last one, then, opportunities to innovate and explore. So again, this is providing yourselves or or people you work with in your teams the opportunity to try out new things. Um, but with that, the, the idea of psychological safety, where people can try things out without the fear of failure um, and move beyond their comfort zone, challenge themselves um, and develop their skills into new areas um, and not, not become stuck in, stuck in ruts and doing similar things and being afraid to try new things because the culture of the team or the, the company might, might, might um, be maybe a bit blame focused and not not allow people the freedom to to innovate and explore new areas. So, just looking at the time there, I think I, I'm pretty much towards the end of my monologue here, um, and that's that's kind of my my journey of discovery around flow to date. I'm still very early on in that journey. I think, um, and like I, as I said, like ideally, I think we'd all love to work in an environment where people could focus 100 percent on projects. You know, things they have a keen interest in, and things are really that that tap into your your signature strengths, where you have clear goals and amazing feedback and all that good stuff. But of course, like in reality that's not always going to be possible or at least not all of the time but i think if we can if we can try and think about bringing some of these things into our to our working lives like setting clear goals for yourself or your team and um, ensuring you give and receive like prompt effective feedback bringing those strengths in things you might use in other areas of your lives like are you a member of a sports club or are you a member of like community groups are you using skills there that you could bring into your job and um, that could bring bring value and, and personal fulfillment um, and could go a long way to, to helping you achieve flow. Um, so lot, lots of things to think about there, but I, I think I've, I've spoken enough. So I think if there's a bit of time, Neve, I might open a, a couple of questions uh, to the group. And I'd love to just, just spend a bit of time um, just hearing of your experiences with flow um, or getting in the zone. Um, and the, the first question I have is, have you experienced flow in the last week? Has anyone experienced flow in the last week? And how did you feel? Is anyone brave enough to tell us? Um, I'll go ahead. So, hi, uh, my name is Ashling. I'm a learning and development specialist in HubSpot. And I feel that I definitely experienced flow in the last week because like the first two weeks of each month is our busiest time when we're onboarding new hires and to be able to schedule all the sessions and then facilitate the sessions and then dive into the data of it. But I love what you called out is that to actually ask yourself at the end of the day, was I in flow? Because sometimes I'm like, oh, it's lunchtime or I miss lunch or I have to go and collect the kids from school or something like that. But and then like you can really kind of reward yourself for I was in the flow, I did it. But because I have so many tasks to kind of tick off, I kind of I'm very aware when I'm not in the flow. And then I kind of get a bit mad at myself for not being at my peak where I know I should be getting stuff done. Um, but especially this week, I definitely saw it where I was in the flow and it felt great. And I used my Asana board and I ticked off my tasks I had to do. And um, so it felt great to be there and rewarding as well, because I was setting myself realistic goals for the day instead of putting everything on the one day and then feeling super overwhelmed. And um, so it kind of it set me up for the week. And then obviously to have this session was just amazing as well. But that was my experience. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Ashley. So you're, yeah, you're setting that goal, which is crucial. So the challenge is achievable and you have the skills to meet that. And you're, you're obviously enjoying what you're doing there. So you have, you have a lot of those conditions there to, to get into that flow state. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Ashley. Anybody else? 
I can share something from last Saturday from my private life. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, I was at a wedding cocktail. So you can imagine there was a lot going on and a lot of stimulation. And I was there with a neighbor and we got into a very deep conversation where she wanted to share something very, very personal. And the rest of the world just disappeared. And I was in a little bubble with her. And I don't know how long we were in that conversation, but um, what I find about flow is I'm in it I, unintentionally. It's not planned. I'm not aware. And it's only when you come out now, like you ask the question that you're aware. Oh, yeah, I have been in it. Um, and it would be really nice to become more intentional about de developing the conditions for ourselves so that we can experience it more. So thank you, Ronan. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Fernando. Yeah, it's it would be great if you could say, right, at 11 o'clock, I'm going to get into flow <laughs> for an hour and a half and it's going to be brilliant. But that's like one of the one of the challenges or one of the mysteries is like when and how does it happen? And I don't know if anybody's body's into golf, but Patrick Harrington um, used to talk a lot about like getting into this zone where like just everything was, you know, automatic. He didn't have to think about what he was doing. He would just hit the golf ball and like that's that's when he would excel and win tournaments and then a week later you know everything would would seem to be the same but you know he had nagging thoughts or he was you know anxious about something that was happening later and he wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to play golf so you're saying the challenge for him is like how do i get what are the conditions i need to get into that state um, but even overthinking it like that can prevent it as well. Even even being too aware of it and trying to get into it can can prevent it. So I think the best thing you can do is try to create those conditions like that that we spoke about, like the clear goals and you know there's access to feedback and something that you enjoy doing, and then it's much more likely to happen at least. Brilliant, thanks, Carolyn. Anybody else before I move on to the next question? Yeah, hi, yeah. hi, go ahead. Hi, you go ahead, Ron. <clears throat> oh, are you sure? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks. Um, uh, hi, Neve. Uh, hi, hi, Ronan. I'm, I'm figuring your tea is cold, Ronan. Uh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, really, really good. And, and just to pick up on Ashling's point and, and Carolyn's, if I have that right, um, yeah, very much uh, aligned with what Ashling and, and Carolyn has uh, said there. Um, and it's 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 interesting you know um i suppose it's it's, it's something i've learned um since um i was involved with uh, alan and the team in, in kinch lines and um pro probably recognizing it more so um and i think the one point i wanted to pick up on is that equally i have flow at home in my personal life with maybe diy or whatever i do uh, versus work and um it, it, it's kind of great to be able to recognize uh, when you when you're in that flow uh, moment and and certainly uh, I have that experience of the cold cup of tea I, I am a big tea drinker and uh, yeah I, I have had that experience where it has gone cold but it's it, the, the main one really is the um, <clears throat> time just come by so fast and, and you're not recognizing it and you're you're kind of into that uh, next question, I guess, where um, where it does make you feel really, really good, and um, so yeah, a lot, as I said, in common with what the, the ladies have spoken about there. And uh, I suppose my point is trying to recognise it, and um, the the overview you've provided today um, is is been really helpful because I think um, it's how do you explain it to your your team, and how do you get your team to sort of uh, figure out and find out how to get into flow. And I think it, it makes for a, a very well-being uh, for, for you and your team. And um, I think most importantly, not not tipping over the edge of the curve that you've shown, because equally, you know, um, in everybody's frantic uh, day job uh, and their evening job at home, et cetera, um, you know, you can easily tip down that curve. So it's, it's about really managing that decline, I think, into that red zone. Uh, so um, thank you for sharing all of that with us this morning. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Ronan. And yeah, I love your idea or your example of DIY. That That's a perfect example of an activity where you can get into flow because you have real clarity about what you're trying to achieve. You can see yeah. it in front of you. You're getting that immediate feedback. You're, you're probably challenging yourself unless it's something that you do every day. But typically DIY, the nature of it, you don't do it every day. 
Um, and I, yeah, recently actually, I we got a new dishwasher and there was a, a, a wooden board at the bottom underneath that when I put it back in, the dishwasher door wouldn't open. So I needed to cut a bit out and I'm really bad at DIY. And I said, oh, listen, I have to do, I have a saw in the shed. I'm going to tackle this myself. You know, I'm going to be a hero. And it took me about like 30 minutes to saw this, this piece out, but I was totally involved and I really yeah. enjoyed it. I was thinking, God, you know, maybe it's not too late to become a carpenter. <laughs> it was amazing because you could really, I could really, yeah. you know, it's I was trying to do it. And then I, yeah. I put it back in and the dishwasher yeah. opened. I'm still out of it. So, yeah, so that's, a, that's a great example. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ronan. Anyone else, or will I move on to Ronan, the next just, question? Just before we do that, I'm just conscious yeah. of the time, and so, so we can absolutely oh, yeah. continue this conversation. But I just for anybody who does have to jump up to drop off, even uh, let me just, um, Ronan, I'm just going to stop your screen there for a moment, um, if you don't mind, and, and sure, let me yeah. just share this for um, just so that people um, know what's coming up next. If um, for anyone who does have to drop off. Uh, have I done that? Have I shared my screen? Can everyone see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So you have that moment where you think, oh, am I sharing it correctly or not? So apologies. Uh, so next week or next month, even we have Eileen, um, who will be, um, introducing us, you know, to us, this idea of measuring and, and kind of really getting, um, getting to grips with the impact of executive coaching. So I'm really excited about that. And just to date for your diaries is the 23rd of November, um, again, at 11 o'clock. Um, again, for anyone who has to leave, the recordings will be up next week on LinkedIn group. If you're not already a member of that, ping me a note or, or Tanya um, or Billy even, and we can have you join, uh, join that, um, that session. Um, I don't think there's anything else. If you do have to drop off, thank you very much for your time today. And if not, I'll hand you back to Ronan. Thank you for that, Ronan. Sorry for interrupting. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Nave. I might just share. Yeah. People have another five or 10. There's just another, there's an interesting conversation. So um, let me just share if there's a couple other questions here. And I think we can, we can share these with people afterwards as well, Nave. Um, yeah. It might, might help to, just to get people yeah. thinking about, yeah. about flow a little bit more. It should be nice. Um, so yeah, what are your indicators of flow? So mine, as I spoke about, there's the cold cup of tea and Roman spoke, spoke about something similar as well. Um, again, you might like, you might not notice, like Ashley, you spoke about you were aware that you were in flow, which is really interesting. Um, but uh, is there anyone else who, who just following this conversation has, has kind of thought, well, actually, that's, you know, there's an indicator for me that I might have got into flow. There was there something that jumped out the time fly by or um, the, the rest of the world seemed to melt away. Is there anything like that that might jump out for anybody? Oh, for to for me, something? one of your, your, your bits, Ronan, earlier on in, in terms of how... Um, uh, say performers or artists where, where work flow just kind of flows out with minimal effort that that's kind of a, a key indicator for me that it just becomes easy you know work is easy for for, for a period of time or uh, you, you you produce at a, a much faster rate than would typically be the norm and, and kind of get more just get more stuff done and um, without it feeling like you're working harder or that there's particular effort involved that that, that always for me is the kind of key Thing, I think looking back as uh, that that indicates that that there's kind of uh, a flow state or, or a, a, an approximation of one achieved yeah brilliant and that like obviously is a state that you want to you want to go back and get into that state again like I, ideally if you're doing that that a lot so yeah absolutely that that sounds like flow um and yeah there there are so many different different indicators so yeah I was just interested to hear to hear if, if if any anyone had anything completely different. Um, there are any others? I would find it very hard to to name this, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking the whole way through. Like, I don't have my. I'm sure I have the cup of tea equivalent, but I'm, you know, I find it very hard to notice what that is. But one thing I think, Ashley, when you were talking about, it, you know, having that good that sense of, you know, I had a good day. Like I, 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 I things just flowed to your point, Alton. They just things just got done. And you know that way where you say, "So God, I had a good day at work today." And then you have to think, well, what actually did I get done? It's like, it's very hard to even name all of those things, but you just have this sense of there's, there's a good energy behind it. Whereas the comparison and, and, and to come back to your point, Ronan, about how your tea drinking differs, the, the, the energy that's behind the stress, the stress place, whereas like Ronan, when you were saying you go off the curve the other way, when it's, when it's stress energy, you can probably still get the same amount done, but it's a different 
feel there's a different residue or something from it. I, I, I can't quite name it. I'll have to, I'll have, this will have to be, I'll have to take this one away and find out the right words for it. But it's, there's a, dis, yeah. there's a distinct feeling. There's a different, very different feeling around them. And I think that, yeah, that, that distinction is like, um, it's, is it sustainable or not? And if like you could get lots done, you could be really productive going into that red zone but it's not sustainable. You can't, you, you might be, you might have an hour or two of that in, in, in you, but after that, you know, you might need to lie down. Whereas when you're in that green zone, quite often you could, you know, you could go open-ended at that. And it's something that you want to go back to in the red zone. You might think, great, I got all that done. But God, you know, I don't want to go there again for at least another week or two. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. But jump on to the next question. Um, what are your flow thieves at work? So like multitasking is obviously a big one, distractions, lack of goal, clarity, lack of feedback. Um, anybody, any thoughts on that? I really loved, Ronan, I'm sorry to jump in there. I really loved that little graphic on the, the impact of multitasking. And, and I'm, with your permission, I'm totally going to steal that because I, I think we all know that multitasking isn't you know, an effective way of working. But I see Slack here. I see you're clearly there's a lot of emphasis behind your, your comment there on Slack. But it, I think that we, while we do know that um, multitasking doesn't work for us, we still drive ourselves to it. You know, we kind of say, no, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. So I think from a leader perspective, having the knowledge that this actually doesn't work, that you are way more productive um, your team can be way more productive when you can create the environment where the multitasking is minimized. I think that was that was a huge one. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and something yeah. something that um, strikes me, and it's actually not one of the not one of the five really in terms of the flow teams that you went through, but something that's interesting. I'm not in the world of L and D at all. I'm in the world of finance, and there's kind of two interesting things that pop out of that. One is that a huge amount of our work is kind of process rather than project, you know, and it's it's cyclical and comes around again and again. So um, that kind of means that the challenge and the, the keeping challenge going for people or for yourself can be quite difficult because in reality, the work is more or less the same in a, a kind of repetitive manner. Um, and, and another thing I think that kind of falls out of that is that, um, and, and, you know, maybe it's kind of a strong indicator that I, maybe I shouldn't be in the world of finance, but the, the whole piece around kind of intrinsically enjoyable or intrinsically rewarding work, there's, there are difficulties, I think, when a lot of what you do revolves around numbers on a page or numbers in a system in, in, in kind of relating back to, to having that kind of what you do is intrinsically rewarding or enjoyable because you know, fundamentally it's fair. You know, a lot of it isn't that, it's not important in a global view. It's very important in terms of what we're doing and in terms of the job but it doesn't have that same, you know, perhaps external reward that bringing somebody's performance along as a culture facilitator might have, or, you know, helping somebody to plot their career path might have. It's it, it, it maybe a little bit um, kind of duller. Yeah. Also, it sounds like you need to be in the L and D space. <laughs> but no, it's really interesting why you're, why you're describing there, because like I have the technology background and I, I, I would have said something very similar in terms of like, that, that's not massively fulfilling and you can't get huge, like it, it's a job, I can get it done. Um, but then then I worked with lots of people who would do that at home and, you know, and they're not getting paid, you know, happily or at weekends. Um, so it, I suppose it probably comes down to individual differences and what people are into. But in, in your own case, and again, like a, just just based on what you've said, if they're, they're, like you mentioned, they're coaching and facilitating as being more fulfilling. Like some people would run a mile from that, but you, you clearly think that that would be something interesting and fulfilling so you know that might be somewhere where you have a strength or you have a natural ability and is it are there opportunities to blend a little bit of that into your role that's that's kind of what I was touching on earlier around you know we're not going to throw all the numbers or all the tech out the window this is what we need to do in our current roles but it's about broadening the horizons and seeing are there other things that I, I can bring in like is there a, a forum for finance people where I you know bring people together and we chat about challenges you know where you're facilitating and that that kind of thing where where you might get a lot of personal fulfillment while still doing the, the bread and butter. But yeah, no inter interesting points. Any anyone else, any flow thieves? 
Yeah, hi, Ronan. I'll give you some my, uh, my flow teams. I suppose that the, the most famous one is the CC list on email. So how many times do we get emails and you're on the CC list? And it was something someone said to me and I try to share with people is uh, just if you're on the CC list, don't engage with the email. Like by all means, tag it as, you know, like related to a project or whatever. But if you're not deemed important enough to be on the to list, you, you, you know, don't get distracted and flow into the conversation and feel you need to res respond. And a similar kind of extension of that would be meetings you know again if you're invited to a meeting assess it and look at it and especially if you're an optional attendee and say well will i be speaking for more than two or three minutes at this meeting uh, and if the answer is no and there's somebody else in your area going to it um again decline the meeting and uh, you know if you want ask them to send on the, the minutes afterwards so but that they're the real big things and i have to I have to remind myself to obey my own rules because sometimes I find myself going headlong into reply to an email but you just have to pull the brakes on and say yeah no listen no, I don't need to I mean I don't need this distraction I can continue in my zone here so that would be yeah. that's um that's that's really interesting on the CC list I did a course just a day-long CPD course a couple of years ago and um the gentleman who delivered the course said that one of his things he's kind of a transformation consultant and one of the things he does and encourages is that you just turn off CC so that you've got Microsoft Office or Microsoft Exchange as a business, CC is not available. Um, and that means that the only people you send an email to are people who you're sending it to. And it, it was actually quite a discussion built up in the class between a couple of people who were very entrenched in the idea of receiving lots of emails in CC so they can keep an eye on stuff. Um, but, but I thought that was an interesting thing that he, he, his was a... Uh, uh, kind of a final solution we turn it off and that means that you know we have the number of emails going across the company but we don't actually you know in, in, in we don't reduce the effectiveness because everyone still gets the emails they need to get yeah no absolutely um and actually it's called out slack there yeah i hear you but like what you're describing there guys as well i'd even take that like or take a step back from that and like email and see being cc'd on emails is, a, is it like a massive cause of noise for people um but in terms of flow even even looking at your email um is it is a flow thief and and you would hear kind of experts in this space say or recommending that you know look at your email for 15 minutes in the morning for 15 minutes at 12 o'clock 15 minutes at three o'clock and in between that like i'm living in fantasy world here i know people need to keep an eye on their their emails more often than that um, but by even looking and checking your inbox and before you even get to the stage of seeing you were CC'd on the mail, but even by going to check your email or having a notification to pop up on your desktop saying an email came in, all of that stuff like hugely detrimental to, to people people getting in flow. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly try myself to look at email. Like I open up Outlook and Calendar View, so I don't even look at my emails to begin with. And I try to have certain times of the day where I look at, at new mails i'm really bad at it um and same with microsoft teams i try to use it on a drawdown like when i have time allocated i'll go and look at my messages so that my time in between i'm free to focus on whatever i need to do um but yeah we live in the real world and that's that's hard to do thank you so much ronan i bet i because i could honestly keep this conversation going for the full day but <laughs> I need to be conscious of these blow thieves. We have to mind our own our meetings, and probably another one is to finish on time when you say when you say you will. So thank you for that, and thank you for giving us. I have taken so much from today's session, and I'm really looking forward to getting the slides and everything and all of that. So I'm looking forward to that. So for anyone, again, you will find all of those in the LinkedIn group. Um, if you're not already a member, send me a line, and I'll I'll, I'll have you added to that. Um, Ronan, that was fab. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed that. And I hope you all got something useful from it today. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks nice day. Bye. Bye. Take, Take care. Slow. Mind yourself. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.